Hello, dear students. Welcome to this program. Today, we are discussing an interesting topic, which is determination of primary structure and synthesis of peptides. Primary structure of a protein, peptides, synthesis of peptides in solution, chemical and enzymatic synthesis of peptides. Before discussing the topic in detail, the main objectives to understand are Determination of the primary structure of a protein What are the peptides? How peptides are synthesized in the solution? Chemical and enzymatic synthesis of peptides Let us start with our first objective Determination of the primary structure of a protein the first determination of the complete amino acid sequence of a protein, that of the bovine polypeptide hormone insulin by Frederick Sanger in 1953, was of enormous biochemical significance in that it definitely established that proteins have unique covalent structures. Since that time, the amino acid sequences of tens of thousands of proteins have been elucidated. This extensive information has been of central importance in the formulation of modern concepts of biochemistry. The elucidation of the 51 residue primary structure of insulin was a labor of many scientists over a period of a decade that altogether utilized 100 gram of protein. Procedures for primary structure determination have since been so refined and automated that proteins of similar size can be sequenced by an experienced technician in a few days using only a few microgram of protein. The sequences of the 1021 residue enzyme galactosidase in 1978 signaled that the sequence analysis of almost any protein could be reasonably attempted. Despite these technical advances, the basic um, procedure for primary structure determination using the techniques of protein chemistry is that developed by Sanger. The procedure consists of three conceptual parts, each of which requires several laboratory steps. First, prepare the protein for sequencing. It includes end group analysis, cleavage of the disulfide bonds, separation, purification and characterization, specific peptide cleavage reactions. Sequence determination, ordering the peptide fragments, assignment of disulfide bond positions. Sequence the polypeptide chains. For it, we fragment the individual subunits at specific points to read peptides small enough to be sequenced directly. Separate and purify the fragments. Determine the amino acid sequence of each peptide fragment. Organize the complete structure. In this, we span the cleavage points between one set of peptide fragments by the other. Elucidate the positions of the disulfide bonds, if any, between and within the subunits. Now, the various steps in detail. First one, the end group analysis, which is useful to determine how many different types of subunits are present. Each polypeptide chain, if it's not chemically blocked or circular, has an N-terminal residue and a C-terminal residue. By identifying these end groups which can establish the number of chemically distinct polypeptides in a protein. There are two methods for it. One, N-terminal amino acid analysis, N-terminus identification. The determination of the N-terminal amino acid which forms the N-terminus of a peptide chain is useful as it helps in ordering the individual peptide fragment sequences into a complete chain. The N-terminal amino acid analysis is done as follows. React the peptide with a reagent that will selectively label the terminal amino acid. Hydrolyze the protein. Determine the amino acid by chromatography and comparison with standards. There are several effective methods by which a polypeptide's N terminal residue may be identified. They all react and bind with the amine group in the side chains of amino acids such as lysine. 
it's necessary to be careful in interpreting the chromatograms to ensure that the right spot is chosen for analysis. The various reagents are the Sanger's reagent in which FNDB that is 1-fluoro-2,4-dinitrobenzene is used. Dinitrofluorobenzene reacts with the amine a group in amino acids to produce dinitrophenyl amino acids. These DNP amino acids are moderately stable under acid hydrolysis conditions that break peptide bonds. The DNP amino acids can then be recovered and the identify of those amino acids can be discovered through chromatography. Densylation in which one dimethyl amino naphthalene 5 sulfonyl chloride that is densyl chloride reacts with primary amines including the alpha amino group of lysine to read densylated polypeptides. Acid hydrolysis of densylated polypeptides liberates the N-terminal residue as a densyl amino acid which exhibits such intense yellow fluorescence that it can be chromatographically identified from as little as 100 picomoles of material and free amino acids. In another method of N-terminal residue identification called Adman degradation named after its inventor Fair Adman. Phenyl isothiocyanate, that is Adman's reagent, reacts with the N-terminal amino groups of protein under mildly alkaline conditions to form their phenyl thiocarbamide, that is PTC adduct. This product is treated with an anhydrous strong acid such as a trifluoroacetic acid, which cleaves the N-terminal residue as its thiazoleonone derivative but does not hydrolyze other peptide bonds. The Adman degradation therefore releases the N-terminal amino acid residue but leaves intact the rest of the polypeptide chain. The thiazolinone amino acid is selectively extracted into an organic solvent and is converted to the more stable phenylthiohydrogen that is PTH derivative by treatment with aqueous acid. This PTH amino acid is most commonly identified by comparing its retention time on HPLC with those of known PTH amino acids. Now coming to C-terminal amino acid analysis, that is C-terminus identification. The number of methods available for C-terminal amino acid analysis are less than available for that of N-terminal amino acid analysis. There is no reliable chemical procedure comparable to the Edmund degradation for the sequential L-group analysis from the C-terminus of a polypeptide. This can be done enzymatically, however, using exopeptidases that is the enzymes that cleave a terminal residue from a polypeptide. One class of exopeptidases called the carboxypeptidases catalyze the hydrolysis of the C-terminal residues of polypeptides. Carboxypeptidases, like all enzymes, are highly specific that is selective for the chemical identities of the substances whose reactions they catalyze. The side chain specificities of the various carboxypeptidases in common use are listed in table. The second type of exopeptidase are listed in table that is the aminopeptidases sequentially cleave amino acids from the N-terminus of a polypeptide and have been similarly used to determine N-terminal sequences. Cleavage of the disulfide bonds Disulfide bonds are most often cleaved reductively by 2 mercaptoethanol. Separation, purification, and characterization of the polypeptide chains. A protein's subunit dissociation as well as denaturation occurs under acidic or basic conditions, at low salt concentrations, at elevated temperatures, or through the use of denaturing agents such as urea, gonadinium, iron or detergents such as sodium dodecyl sulfate, that is SDS. The dissociated subunits can then be separated by various methods that capitalize on small differences in polypeptide size and polarity. SDS page, ion exchange, 
and gel filtration chromatography usually by HPLC are most often used. Specific peptide cleavage reactions Polypeptides of greater length must therefore be cleaved either enzymatically or chemically to fragments small enough to be sequenced. Cleavage is specific. Trypsin specifically cleaves peptide bonds after positively charged residues. Endopeptidases, that is enzymes that catalyze the hydrolysis of internal peptide bonds, like exopeptidases have side chain requirements for the residues flanking the sessile to be cleaved peptide bonds. The side chain specificities of the endopeptidases most commonly used to fragment polypeptides are listed in table. Trypsin cleaves peptide bonds on the C side, that is towards the carboxyl terminus of the positively charged residues arginine and lysine if the next residue is not proline. And cyanogen bromide specifically cleaves peptide bonds after methionine residues. Separation and purification of the peptide fragments. Reverse phase chromatography by HPLC has largely reduced the separation of peptide fragments to a routine procedure. Sequence determination. This is done through repeated cycles of the adenine degradation and use of modern polyvalidine fluoride, that is PVDF, sequencers. Ordering the peptide fragments. This is done by comparing the amino acid sequences of one set of peptide fragments with those of a second set whose specific cleavage site overlap those with the first set. Assignment of disulfide bonds positions. The final step in an amino acid sequence analysis is to determine the positions, if any, of the disulfide bonds. This is done by cleaving and then separating peptide fragments by reverse phase at HPLC. Peptide characterization and sequencing by mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry, that's MS, has emerged as an important technique for characterizing and sequencing polypeptides. MS accurately measures the mass-to-charge ratio for ions in the gas phase, where M is the ion's mass and Z is its charge. However, the development of two techniques has eliminated the other limitations. Electrospray ionization, that is ESI, and matrix assisted laser desorption or ionization, that is MALDI. Now, coming to peptide synthesis. Peptides are heteropolymers composed of amino acid residues linked by peptide bonds between the carboxyl group of one amino acid residue and the alpha amino group of the next one. Chemical synthesis of peptides. The chemical route is often a better technological option than the biotechnological methods of recombinant DNA and biocatalysts for the synthesis of medium sized peptide molecules. It's also a fundamental tool for understanding the structure function relationship in proteins and peptides. The synthesis of peptides was originally performed in solution. However, since the introduction of solid phase synthesis by Mary Field in 1986, this technology has gained more relevance and significant advances contributing in this way of the advancement of organic chemistry as a powerful tool for protein and peptide research. Solid phase synthesis of peptides. Solid phase peptide synthesis, that is SPPS, consists of the elongation of a peptidic chain encoded to a solid matrix by successive addition of amino acids, which are linked by amide peptide bond formation between the carboxyl group of the incoming amino acid and the amino group of the amino acid previously bound to the matrix until the peptide of the desired sequence and length has been synthesized. Mary Field introduced the method of solid phase synthesis in 1963. The strategy of synthesis, uh, the coupling reagents and the procedure of cleavage of the peptide from the solid matrix are the most relevant variables in SPPS. Usually peptides are synthesized from the carbonyl group side that is C terminus to amino group side that is N terminus of the amino acid chain. 
In this method, although peptides are synthesized in the opposite direction in cells, in peptide synthesis, an amino protected amino acid is bound to a solid phase material, most commonly low cross linked polystyrene beads forming a covalent bond between the carbonyl group and the resin, most often an amido or an aster bond. Then the amino group is deprotected and reacted with the carbonyl group of the next amino protected amino acid. The solid phase now bears a dipeptide. The cycle is repeated to form the desired peptide chain. After all the reactions are complete, the synthesized peptide is cleaved from the bead. The protecting groups for the amino groups mostly used in the peptide synthesis are 9 fluorine methyl oxycarbonyl group and T butyl oxycarbonyl group. Now, coming to enzymatic synthesis of peptides. Enzymes are the biological catalysts responsible for cell metabolism. As such, they must perform well at the mild conditions required for cell functioning. Proteolytic enzymes comprise a group of hydrolases that is the most relevant in technological terms. Sharing about one half of the world's market of enzymes with annual sales of about US dollar 3 billion. Microbial and plant proteases are the most relevant and have been widely utilized in medicine and in different industrial processes for decades. Microbial proteases are the most important in terms of market share because of the advantages of the intensive production. However, plant and some animal proteases are still relevant for certain medical and industrial applications. New proteases from endogenous plant species have been characterized and proved their efficacy for performing hydrolytic and synthetic reactions. New sources of proteases are continuously being reported, especially from exotic organisms that thrive in extreme environments, being that their proteases are abnormally stable and are active at such extreme conditions. Proteases are active at mild conditions with pH optima in the range of 6 to 8. They are robust and stable, do not require stoichiometric cofactors and are also highly stereo and regioselective. These properties are quite relevant to use them as catalysts in organic synthesis. This is possible because proteases can not only catalyze the cleavage of peptide bonds but also the formation as well as other reactions of relevance for organic synthesis. For instance, the regiospecific hydrolysis of asters and the kinetic resolution of racemic mixtures. Substilicin, chymotrypsin, trypsin and papin have been widely used proteases in the synthesis of peptides. Here we come to the conclusion of today's topic. Hope you enjoyed and understood it well. Have a nice time. Thank you.